bill while in the California State Assembly. Sometimes we had testimony of women having to uh, go to a car with 100 degree heat like today and uh, breastfeed uh, in there. And even in the workplace, women have found maintaining breastfeeding to be fraught with obstacles. For most women who have to relegate to uh, pumping or breastfeeding in a bathroom, who wants to eat in a bathroom? But now with the grant from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, new mothers who work at City Hall have a clean and private alternative. This isn't just a woman's issue. This is a family issue, and this is a community issue. Women should have the dignity and the privacy and the respect that they deserve to breastfeed their children when they go back to work. And Councilman Cardenas says this lactation room is just the first of dozens to open at the city's many facilities. Breastfeeding has been proven to protect infants against respiratory and ear infections, sudden infant death syndrome, diabetes, and childhood obesity. It can also lower the mother's risk of breast and ovarian cancer. It's not often we get the chance to do something for our public servants, so when the opportunity came along to give back to the men and women of the L.A. Fire Department, there was no shortage of volunteers. Several hundred people gave up a recent Saturday to help transform the Los Angeles Fire Department's Frank Hotchkin Memorial Training Center. The large-scale service project at the historic site was a way for residents to thank LAFD men and women for their ongoing public service. As you can see, we have painting uh, going on, we have weed pulling going on, they're putting rock, decorative rock in around the facility, really upgrading the landscape and the sprinkler system. So we're making a lot of great improvements that are going to uh, benefit the facility for years to come. The volunteers were organized by LA Works, a volunteer center for community and corporate service. They hailed from companies such as Northrop Grumman, The Home Depot, L.A. Dodgers, and Pink's Hot Dogs, just to name a few. And those volunteers made it a family event by enlisting their spouses and kids to help get the work done faster. Together, they landscaped, washed fire trucks, dusted light fixtures, and much more. I'm with my mom and my dad and my sister, and we're helping out the firefighters clean up the facility. And this girl didn't let her injury keep her away. She scraped and painted with one hand while holding on to her crutch with the other. Now that's dedication. Uh, every day when we come here and the outside agencies that uh, come here, they're going to notice all the work that you have done. The feeling of appreciation was mutual. Families were grateful they could spend quality time together while giving back to their firefighters. That feels good because like, they help us, so we want to help them back. When they need it. Volunteers also had a lot of fun goofing off. Many took home a souvenir photo of themselves dressed up as firefighters. And why not? They kind of did save the day. And if you're interested in volunteering through LA Works, go to laworks.com. And there's also a lot of beautification going on on our city streets, thanks to the L.A. Conservation Corps. Rasha Goel shows us what some young men and women are doing to help make over the city on their summer break. On any given day during the summer, these young kids are out helping clean up the city as volunteers with the L.A. Conservation Corps. But today is a little different. They have an audience. That's because it's Bring Your Parents to Work Day. Today's a day where the students bring their parents and work alongside with them to see what type of work they do during their vacation. It makes me understand and appreciate that my daughter is going to work and helping the community. So, I mean, I appreciate LACC and the children for working hard. These teens from the ages of 14 to 17 are part of the Conservation Corps Clean and Green program that helps beautify neighborhoods. It allows people to feel change. When people feel change, you know, they feel comfortable and safe in the neighborhood. It's an awesome opportunity to come out and see the people driving by, waving, and, and seeing that we're trying to make our mark in the community with Clean and Green. The Los Angeles Conservation Corps provides at-risk young adults and school-aged kids with an opportunity to succeed. This is a great organization for young people to join because it teaches them life skills, job skills, how to, how to get things done. Especially when it comes to giving back to their communities. From downtown LA, I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. Clean and Green is one of the LA Conservation Corps' oldest ongoing youth and workforce development programs.
Well, we regularly report on the opening of new park space in the city, but it's the people behind the scenes, residents themselves, who are the real engines that drive the project. That's the case in El Sereno, where residents, after three decades, may finally have their park. It's not a celebration without the local drill team. And there's a whole heck of a lot to celebrate on this day if you ask one of the many El Sereno residents who showed up for the groundbreaking of the soon-to-be green space at the intersection of Alhambra and Concord Avenues, also known as the S-Curve. I think it's the great, greatest thing that's happened here in probably 50 years. Uh, we don't have a park uh, that we could use uh, within three miles. If Val Marquez's enthusiasm seems a tad disproportionate to the occasion, that's because he and his group, concerned neighbors of El Sereno, have been working behind the scenes for decades to make this park a reality. And I just always asked myself, I wonder why it's an empty lot. I wonder why it's such a waste of land. One main reason the city wasn't able to move faster on the project was that the land was owned by Caltrans and not the city of Los Angeles. The breakthrough came when Councilmember Jose Huizar helped garner a 25-year lease agreement between Caltrans and the LA Department of Recreation and Parks. And when we cut the ribbon on this park, that that 25-year lease was worth all the efforts and everything we put into this. More than 4,000 children live within one mile of the project site. That's why the park is just the start of many more improvements, including... Sidewalks, guardrails, and pedestrian access with appropriate signage around this area to make sure that we're not only improving this parcel, but we're improving the area around here to make it a, a safe park as well. This is something we need around here to keep kids out of the streets. The seniors will be able to come in and walk. Right now they're walking the streets. Once completed, the 1.3 acre site will be transformed into a recreation area with a nature garden, walking paths, and exercise equipment. Something for everyone in El Sereno to enjoy. The fruits of labor born from real community effort. In addition to the Department of Recreation and Parks, the Trust for Public Land had been the lead agency on the project. Well, police urge caution on the road as the end of summer nears. One flyaway shuttle service to LAX has been discontinued and celebrating Nisei Week in Little Tokyo. These stories and more in City Beat. The LAPD will be conducting several checkpoints throughout the city from now through the Labor Day weekend to crack down on drunk driving. It's part of a statewide drive sober or get pulled over campaign. In 2010 alone, 791 people died in California in alcohol-related car and motorcycle crashes. The age group with the highest percentage of alcohol-impaired driving fatalities in motor vehicle traffic crashes was the 21 to 24 age group. Police say programs like checkpoints as well as the sober graduation campaign targeting young drivers help reduce alcohol impaired driving fatalities. The city of Los Angeles has been celebrating Navy Days since 1997, and this year was no different as members of the public were treated to free tours of a U.S. Navy destroyer and U.S. Coast Guard cutter George Cobb at the Port of Los Angeles. Every year we welcome a ship to port in support of the Navy League which promotes and educates the public about the sea services, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, and Merchant Marine. The Port of Los Angeles was once the home of battleships and is now also the future home of the USS Iowa. The local Japanese-American community celebrated in Little Tokyo the 72nd annual Nisei Week. Taking place over two straight weekends, the festivities attracted visitors from all over Southern California and beyond. This is an important event and one of the oldest and largest Japanese-American traditions that promote goodwill and cultural exchange. And one of the most popular traditions of Nisei Week is the crowning of a Nisei queen and court. The young women chosen to sit on this year's court paid a visit to council chambers as part of the Nisei Week celebrations. LAX officials have announced they will discontinue flyaway bus service between the airport and the Irvine station in Orange County sometime in September. The operator of the flyaway service at the Irvine Transportation Center recently filed for bankruptcy. This was the third straight year of losses since the Irvine service began in November 2009, with only an average of 48 riders daily. Other flyaway shuttle service locations will not be affected. For information about the LAX flyaway shuttles, go to lawa.aero slash flyaway.
We recently brought you a story on the Lamert Park Book Fair, and now we take you to yet another event that shines the spotlight on the literary world of the African American community. Anna Marcus takes us to the eighth annual Los Angeles Black Book Expo, helping to open up books and minds. Written word, spoken word, any kind of word is welcome here. The Los Angeles Black Book Expo aims to promote book authors and to encourage the black community to read. It also highlights African-American media, history, and issues. We have all sorts of activity, uh, new and aspiring authors, well, actually new authors, and even established authors are selling their books. We have panels and workshops going on, children's area, a spoken word pavilion. Author Danielle Spencer Fields is best known for her role as Dee Thomas in the 70s show, What's Happening? But she's gone on to become a veterinarian and animal show producer, and she's written a book called Through the Fire the journal of a child star. It um, basically talks about my experience um, growing up as a child in the industry, um, how, what I did after the show ended, and then uh, the second part is about how I had a surgery that changed my life, uh, brought me closer to God, and made me realize my purpose. And I, I also wrote it to inspire the disabled community. Books at this expo can be stark and gritty with titles such as Just Like like Compton and Ghetto Diva. Others touch on a broad range of issues from creating wealth to partner violence to building healthy marriages to coping with the stress of being a teen mom. I was a teen mother myself. I got pregnant at the age of 15 and I had my son at 16. It lets these girls know, okay, you can be successful. You can do anything you want to do. All the dreams you had, you can still succeed and there's proof. It's always good if you can support any of your um, authors um, because a lot of us don't go through the big publishers, but anytime you can come out to a book expo, it's always good because you enhance your learning. For more information on the Los Angeles Black Book Expo, visit www. LABBX.com. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. And most of the books mentioned in our story can be found and purchased online. In this week's list of things to do, an art walk in the valley, painting your own Rothko, and the city's pools stay open a little while longer. Shops and restaurants on Devonshire Street near Topanga Canyon Boulevard and local artists have come together to host the West End Chatsworth Summer Art Walk. They have already organized art walk events in June and July, and the final event of the summer is on Friday, August 31st from 5.30 to 9 p.m. on Devonshire Street between Topanga Canyon Boulevard and Owensmouth Avenue. So come on down and support the local businesses and artists. Enjoy refreshments and meet your neighbors. Door prizes include tickets to the Hollywood Bowl. Go to ChatsworthFineArtsCouncil.com for details. And take a guided tour of MoCA's permanent collection on Sunday, September 2nd, and discuss the ideas behind Mark Rothko's large-scale pictures and the techniques used to apply various colors that appear to float on the canvas. The tour from 1 to 3.30 p.m. is part of the museum's Sunday Studio program and includes the opportunity to paint a picture with a guest artist using Rothko's techniques and your own. This participatory hands-on workshop has been designed in collaboration with Center Theater Group's upcoming performance, Red, a play set in the 1950s in Rothko's New York studio. Mocha Grand Avenue is located at 250 South Grand Avenue downtown. Go to mocha.org. And you've still got time to get your swim on as the city's Department of Recreation and Parks has extended summer swim at 46 of its aquatic facilities until Labor Day. That's three extra weeks of swim lessons and recreational swim. For the 14th consecutive year, children under the age of 18, seniors age 65 or older, and the disabled can swim for free at all of the city pools. The rest pay just $2.50 or $2 with the city library card. For more information, call the department's aquatics division at 323-906-7953. And that's a look at some upcoming things to do. That's going to do it for this edition. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ellen Shang. A reminder that you could catch us online at lacityview.org. You can also follow and like us on Facebook. We'll see you back here next week for more of LA This Week.
Come on, let's go. Just a minute, I gotta finish this. Wait, you're gonna post those pictures of Mary? Yep. She thinks she's so hot. But her mom and dad will see them. Her grandmother, her little sister, everyone she knows, it's gonna kill her. Who cares? Just a couple of pictures. It's no big deal. No big deal? Don't. This has gotta stop. Troy McCoven from North Hollywood, you're watching LA City View, Channel 35, our city, our channel.
Good morning. Today's date, Wednesday, August 29th. Welcome to your Los Angeles City Council meeting. The Los Angeles City Council meets every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 a.m. Members of the public are welcome. You can come just to watch your city council work, or if you want to make public comment, you are welcome to do so as well. We also have a series of committee hearings that go on throughout the week, and you're welcome to attend those meetings as well. Okay, Mr. Uh, Labange, we're going to start today's uh, council meeting with the presentation portion of our meeting. And I'd like to call on, if I could please get some quiet. Shh. It would be Mr. Labange making all of the noise. Mr. Labange. I would like to turn it over to you as you honor one of our Los Angeles treasures, a man uh, in his organization that doesn't work for fame or glory. He does this because it's the right thing to do, a very humble man that has never refused any of us. So it is, it's a great day when we can honor a great uh, community activist and friend like Tiger King. With that, I turn it over to you, Mr. Labonte. Well, Mr. President, you said it so eloquently there. Tiger King is one of the great citizens of Los Angeles who is not afraid of organizing people for a good cause. Tiger has been in every beautification project in the metropolitan area for over 10 years. In 2001, at a meeting at the Oxford Hotel in Koreatown, they got together for the World Volunteer Year to promote volunteerism through the globe. This was organized and a part of PAVA, which is called the Pacific American Volunteer Association. PAVA is a group to put together to do good things. And I will tell you, and I'm sure all, I saw many members, Mr. Zion, Mr. Englander, and others, visit with Tiger earlier in the pre-meeting. His group brings out more volunteers than anybody else. His group comes out every year to the annual events, whether it's a special cleanup out of Ardmore Park, uh, right in the heart of Koreatown at Olympic and Normandy, or whether it's at Griffith Park. And uh, I just want to know personally, Mr. President, uh, in responding to an article in the Los Angeles Times uh, where uh, uh, they spoke of Ferdell, the very historic uh, dell in Griffith Park on the western edge, was run down and not cared for. And we all know the tremendous cuts of staffing Recreation of Parks has gone through. Tiger and his group now come every week on Saturday morning, and they rake and clean the beautiful, beautiful Ferndale. And if you haven't been to Ferndale, it's almost unbelievably changed because of Tiger's work. And not only does he rake and pick up leaves and get trash, he puts on boots and gets into the mud, and he's made the water flow again for Ferndale, which was the uh, site of the Tonga uh, Nation's village, historic site that Ferndale is. He truly is an angel in the city of angels. And Kenny over at the sound booth, Kenny, can you run that video for us, please? Ten-year history, Papa. Get the sound, Kenny. You're a sound man. You got to get that, or we got to take you and just call you a man instead of a sound man. <laughs> this shows the great pictures and photographs. Volunteer with Heal the Bay, Clean the Beach, the Ocean, Friends of the Los Angeles Rivers. There they are working on the river right by the Fletcher Street Bridge. You see thousands of volunteers come, not just from Los Angeles, from throughout Southern California uh, to help and clean out the trash and debris. Uh, of the Los Angeles River so it heals the bay. And the work that they do, they articulate volunteerism as a true value to every young Korean American. But the Pacific American Volunteer Association is absolutely number one in the number of volunteers that they turn out. And this is again the Friends of the Rivers Day where they do the work on the river. You see how beautiful the river is when it's clean uh, of trash and debris. Yeah. 
sound. I know. We'll get that sound, Kenny. I, I, here you see all the water flows from a rain season, and all that debris gets carried out to sea unless it's picked out of the river. The city was founded 232 years this uh, Monday, on September 4th, on the banks of the Los Angeles River, what was to be the Los Angeles River. That much trash coming down. And you can see the trash coming in. Here they are on the beach out in Mr. Rosendahl's district in the 11th district, cleaning up, picking up stacks and stacks and piles of plastic uh, bags containerized and go through. And the volunteers are always there. It's part of their value. Tiger, do you want to say something as I do a little audio here? You can see that? Well, before Tiger, let me uh, call on Mitch Englander. Mitch Englander, the 12th District Councilman. All right. So the one question that when you, uh, when you call Tiger and say, we need help, we've got to clean up, let's partner, his first question on the phone is, how many porta potties are you going to have for me? How much supplies, how many trash bags are you going to have? And I said, well, how many bodies can you get? He goes, no, 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 no. Don't ask me how many people I can get to show up. I need to know if you're going to have enough supplies, because I'll get as many people as you need. And in fact, uh, I was reminded, we were just talking earlier, the first time he did, he did this, and we've partnered on, on many projects, uh, he had a coastal cleanup down on the beach, and uh, he had that same conversation. They said, well, I think we're going to have five porta potties. He goes, that's not enough. I'll get 5,000 people to show up. They need a place to go to the bathroom while they're working so they can keep working. I want to make sure they have supplies. I want to make sure they have water and they have food. I need to take care of my people. And sure enough, he showed up with literally bus loads of people to volunteer. Is This guy's a machine. And so not just volunteering to clean up our community, but he also does mentoring and job tra training and job placement. Uh, there's few people like Tiger that uh, can turn those kinds of people out and inspire so many and get people involved in the community and not just in his area, citywide, anywhere. They come and go anywhere. Um, so I applaud you for everything that you continue to do. God bless you for being an angel in the city of Los Angeles. All right, Tiger. Very good. Mr. LeBange. All right. Thank you, Mr. President. Therefore, Mr. LeBange. Yes. Just let me say this. I went to a, a cleanup in your area yes. that uh, Tiger sponsored at Griffin Park. Yes. And Tiger, were there eight or 10,000 volunteers there? I'd never seen anything like that in my life. And they were stationed like army platoons where they were given their assignments and it was quick and, and, and clean. It was an amazing, amazing thing. In fact, where were you? I was up on the hill cleaning up. I got up earlier, Herb. Okay. I go up to the top of the mountain. All right. So now you can present the... Well, uh, Herb, I thank you. It is an amazing sight to see. And members, this is a value that we all need, our partnerships and volunteers in the Pacific Ama uh, American Volunteer Association. Tiger Kang, you're an angel in the city of angels. Let's give Tiger a big hand. Thanks. What do you want to say? Okay. Want to say something? No. And Mr. President, you'll love Tiger because he doesn't want to say anything. Give him a big hand again. Good job, Tiger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But see, that's the way Tiger is. He, he, he never speaks. He doesn't care if you mention his name or, or not. Anyway, uh, Mr. Clerk, we do have a, a quorum at this time. But before you start, I'd like to give a very, very, very special thanks uh, to Miss Perry for uh, adjusting her calendar and uh, coming back here from an earlier uh, engagement. It's because of her that uh, our quorum problems have been solved. So I want to thank uh, Ms. Perry a great deal. With that said, why don't you call the roll and let's go through the agenda. Alarcon, Buscaino, Cardenas, Englander, Garcetti, Weezer, Caris, Cacorin, LaBunch, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosendahl, Zion, Wesson. Ten members present and a quorum. Mr. President. First order of business. Approval of the minutes. Ms. Perry moves. Mr. Park seconds. Next. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Mr. Cardenas moves. Mr. Caret seconds. That brings us where? Mr. President, that brings us to item number one. Item one is an item notice for public hearing, and uh, we have received a card on that matter. Okay, so we'll hold that for card. 
The next section is what, 2 through 12 items? That is correct, sir. Items 2 through 12 are items for which public hearings have been held. A committee report for item 2 uh, will be circulated shortly, and uh, I have been informed from staff that item 13 has an amending motion that is uh, coming forward shortly as well. Okay, so why don't we hold those two items. Mr. Koretz? I'd like to call item 11 special. Item 11 special for Mr. Koretz. Members, any others? Ms. Perry? I'm waiting for the 22. I'm waiting. Okay. Any others? 2 through 12 members? Okay. Let us, uh, Madam Clerk, open the roll on these items. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 10 ayes. For the Department of Aging, 3 and 4, forthwith, please. Okay, without objection, forthwith. Okay, the uh, next section of items, 13 through 20. Uh, yes, sir. Items 13 through 20 are items for which public hearings have not been held. 10 votes are required for consideration. Without objection, those items are now before us, Mr. Zine. 17 special, please. 17 for Mr. Zine. Ms. Perry, was that 20? 22. I have to wait. Oh, so 22. Okay. Any uh, uh, members, Mr. Koretz? Um, I'd like to call uh, 18 special. 18 for Mr. Koretz. And if I could correct uh, item number 11 and ask that that be continued. So you want to continue I'd item 11? I'd like 11? to continue item 11 rather than calling it special. I'd like to okay. Continue, continue it until what date? Um, the next appropriate date that uh, you choose uh, out of convenience. So, what do you want? You need a week. You want less than a week? Uh, uh, Two weeks, I guess, because we'll a week be, would be fine. Okay, uh, Mr. Clerk, can you set this on the first day we come back from uh, recess, or do you want to try to take it up Tuesday? Uh, it, it would be the chair's pleasure. The first available day uh, from uh, first available day is. Uh, Tuesday, September 11, sir. If that would be fine. Okay, so two. Okay. Um, any other specials, members? Do we have cards? Oh, Mr. Englander. Uh, item 10. Item 10, Mitch uh, Englander. Just, just not not to speak on it, but just for a no vote. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mr. Pre President, I'm sorry. Uh, we previously approved item number 10. Oh, then I'll have to recall it. Then you're okay with that? Or do you want us to reconsider it? Reconsider it. Okay, so let's have a vote on reconsideration of item 10. Madam Clerk, open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 10 ayes. Okay, now what would you like to do with item 10? Hold it? No, you can go ahead and vote on it separately. Just go ahead. We can go ahead and vote on it. Sorry, Mr. President, now. Okay, you want to just vote no? Correct. Okay, so let's uh, open the roll on item 10. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. Nine eyes, one no. Okay, next, uh, where are we, Mr. Clerk? M Mr. President, that brings us back to uh, th items 13 through 20. Do we have cards? Uh, yes, sir, we do. We have cards on 13, 14, 15, 16, 18, and 19. Could you repeat that? 13, 14, 15, 16, 18, and 19. Okay, so where does that bring us now? I believe that uh, leaves item 20 for a vote, sir. Then let's uh, open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. Okay. Where are we at now, Mr. Clerk? M Mr. President, item 21 is an item scheduled for closed session. Uh, would you like to hold it on the desk? Uh, until I have a discussion with the budget chair, why don't we hold it? That brings us to... We can't uh, Mr. go President, into the special meeting until... Correct. Okay. So let's go back to uh, presentations then at this point. Ms. Perry, are you ready with your presentation? Okay, so we're going to be joined by Deputy Chief Pat Gannon and his entire fan base, and he has a huge one. Now, um, everybody who is here to support 
Deputy Chief Pat Gannon, would you please just stand up and be recognized? Not only is Deputy Chief here with his family, and I'm going to have him introduce them in a minute, and our Chief of Police, we have Chief Jacobs, Chief Earl Pacinger, uh, Commander Robert Green, Captain Nancy Lauer, Captain Philip Tingridis, Captain Ronald Marbury, Lieutenant Anthony Odo, Sergeant Judy Steiger, Sergeant Imara Tingridis, Officer Christina Labriola, Officer Liz Soli, Officer Marcos Villanueva, Officer Mario Lopez, Officer Anthony Tate, and Officer Kevin Gruner. And if I've missed anyone, Please forgive me, it was not my intention, but uh, it's a big crowd here as you can see, but they, they all love Pat. So it's an honor to celebrate his retirement and his many, many years of service to the department and to the people of Los Angeles. He is a longtime veteran of the Los Angeles Police Department and a commanding officer of Operation South, South Bureau who after 35 incredible years is celebrating his retirement. He has overseen 1,700 sworn officers and 150 civilian employees and has served 800,000 residents in South Los Angeles and in the Port of Los Angeles. He is a third generation Los Angeles police officer and started in 1976 as a police student worker and steadily rose to the ranks of the Los Angeles Police Department. He was a longtime supporter of efforts to reduce violent gang crime through the use of gang intervention and partnerships with intervention agencies. In 2011, Chief Gannon was key in developing the Community Safety Partnership Program between the Los Angeles Police Department and the Housing Authority to establish relationships, community programs, and youth outreach in four housing developments in East Los Angeles and Watts. These partnerships greatly improved the department's relationship with the community and opened up lines of communication and created a mutually beneficial relationship that has enhanced the lives of many. Throughout his long career, his hard work and professionalism has earned him the respect and admiration of all those who had the pleasure of working with him. And so it's my pleasure to, wait, wait that's the other one. That's the, where, 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 there you are, okay, hi, come over here. Okay, that, that's another Gannon over there. Uh, there's, there's a lot of them. Uh, it's my pleasure to thank him for his loyal and dedicated service to the city of Los Angeles and to the people of the city of Los Angeles and to wish him the very best of luck as he moves forward in the next phase of his life. And before he has a chance to speak, I'd like to have his boss, uh, Chief Charlie Beck, say a few words. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. Okay, <laughs> well, first of all, uh, to thank you very, very much, Jan, for, for this opportunity. You know, uh, I've been a police officer just a couple of minutes longer than, than Pat Gannon, and I have known thousands of Los Angeles police officers and officers from, from multiple agencies during that time, and none of them, none of them, hold a candle to Pat Gannon when it comes to humanity, service, and integrity. He is truly the better angel of the Los Angeles Police Department, and I am going to miss him as a friend and as a partner uh, probably, probably more than I know right now. So tomorrow night, <laughs> for those of you that want to mark your calendars, uh, especially especially for uh, Councilman Parks, <laughs> for Councilwoman Perry, for the President of the Council, and for Joe, you're going to be served by uh, the two oldest members <laughs> of the Los Angeles Police Department in a radio car. We're, Pat and I are going to work together tomorrow night. Um, if you call, you just might get us. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we'll have, uh, hopefully uh, Michael or, or one of my kids will actually do the work. But, uh, but, but we will be there and, and you know, I do that uh, very infrequently with, uh, with command staff. I do it out of love for Pat and because, you know, I want to make sure that, uh, that I have a lasting memory of a truly great Los Angeles police officer. So thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. And now a few words from Council Member Joe Buscaino. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Um, 
Well, Chief, it's pretty surreal that I stand here before you honoring you on your retirement. It was you who introduced me to the law enforcement career. You recruited me. I was a young rec assistant at Bogdanovich Park when you took me under your wing. And you said, uh, Joe, you'll be a great LAPD officer. And I said, I'm in. You took me uh, under your wing, and I can't thank you enough for um, introducing me to uh, such a rewarding and blessed career within the Los Angeles Police Department. Um, I look up to you not only as a, uh, you know, I always say this, I look up to you professionally and personally. You're a great father, you're an amazing husband, and you're just a great cop, and we're definitely going to miss, miss you. And, you know, one of our core values in the Los Angeles Police Department is integrity and in all we say and do, and that core value was in, is in your DNA. And uh, just last night, uh, the chief and Michael uh, was patrolling the harbor area, and they came by the house, and the kids were so happy to see him. And just on behalf of my family and, and my wife, Jay, we congratulate you. And let's also recognize Terry Gannon, his beautiful and loving and supportive wife. And it's also her birthday today. How, what a great tribute. But uh, Chief Gannon, your retirement will leave a void in our community, the department, and the city that will not easily be filled. But you have earned your retirement. We thank you for your service to all of us, and uh, we wish you all the best. And I don't think we're, this is the last we're going to hear and see of Pat Gannon and the city family. Thank you. God bless you. And we wish you all the best. So one, one thing I'd like to add about uh, Pat, if that's okay, <laughs> uh, is the, the great love the advocates in the Stop the Violence in the South Bureau, uh, folks who are advocates and community activists, and uh, they have an enormous amount of love for him. Uh, he has built incredible relationships with people, um, you know, to the point where if I say Adela or Vicky, you know exactly who I'm talking about. And uh, I know that uh, your retirement creates big shoes to fill. And uh, you mean a lot to them, and uh, you will never, ever, ever, ever be forgotten for all that you did. Thank you. Ms. Perry, we have several members in the queue, beginning with Mr. Mitchell Englander. Well, this, um, this actually might be a surprise to some of you, but uh, I was listening to the radio this morning. I wasn't quite awake yet, and I hadn't had any coffee. But from my understanding, Mr. President, there was a bunch of advocates out in the city, uh, and they collected 50,000 signatures that said to overturn Pat. And I guess it was for, so they're, they're putting a referendum out on the ballot against your retirement. And uh, I support that. So it l looks like you're going to stay. I didn't know if you were aware of this, but uh, I heard it on the radio this morning. So it's got to be real. Uh, I just want to say uh, thank you uh, for making this such a great department for everything you've done. Um, I, I've known you, but I haven't worked with you directly, but I have heard a lot of stories uh, through one of my uh, near and dearest colleagues. Uh, Joe has shared a lot about you, and, and, and it, it really showed at his inauguration um, all the statements and bringing you up on stage uh, and told the story about how you guys met. And so we blame you, actually, for now we've got another council member in blue, but uh, those hash marks tell a lot of stories. Right? And your family, and this is really goes off to your family as well, because for everything that I've heard and your leadership in the department and what you've done for the city and the community, that means that you had family members at home um, waiting and, and uh, not knowing where you were, all those late nights, missing birthdays, uh, missing holidays, to make a commitment and a sacrifice, a lifelong sacrifice to the city of Los Angeles, and we're forever grateful. Uh, and so I say my hat's off to you. You've earned and deserve a wonderful retirement. But I, I think what we've heard is we haven't seen the last of you. And uh, you're going to stick around doing something somewhere. You've got 24 hours to become a reserve officer from the time you retire. Don't, don't, don't forget about that. But, uh, but thank you for everything. God bless you. Mr. Zine. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mitch, that was pot, not pat, to make sure. <laughs> that referendum, uh, make sure you got that right. Uh, I've known you for many, many years, many, many years, and, and your leadership has been obviously an inspiration to many people. The folks that are here, 
from the Bureau, the folks that have worked alongside of you. I've seen you promote up the ranks. Uh, your son standing next to you, he says now he can go work South Bureau since you're moving out. Uh, but your family tradition, the family tradition of, of Chief Beck with the relatives, the children who were members of the Los Angeles Police Department, handling that down, that baton, as they say, to the next generation that's going to take over uh, police in the city of Los Angeles. But your style of management has always been superior. Not a lot of fanfare. Get the job done. Move in. Take care of business. Uh, and South Bureau is a challenging bureau. There's no question about it. You've handled extremely well. And the folks that are here showing their love, support, and respect for you uh, with the stars, with the bars, with the stripes, the civilian population within the department showing their admiration for what you've done for so many years. You've been in South Bureau a long time. And that leadership obviously has maintained a calm in the community, which in the past has had some challenges. So I want to acknowledge what you've done. Uh, as you see, the city council starting growing and more and more with members of the LAPD who are retiring, uh, Chief Parks, Councilman Parks, myself, Michigan, there's a reserve, Joe. Uh, and now we have another member of the department who's uh, running for city council office to help keep the city on the right focus, to keep it balanced and take care of the people of LA. So I want to commend you for your years dedicated service, your family that stood behind you for all those years. But the way you've done it, not a lot of fanfare, you've got it done in a very efficient, effective manner. And your son with that smile, now he's going to go to the South Bill, he's so happy. So God bless you in your retirement. I know we're going to hear from you, we're going to see you around. You're not leaving this area, uh, and the future is bright for you. So enjoy those days. And what I tell people who go off on that pension, the only thing you have to remember is keep breathing and keep collecting because you put in for that for all those dedicated years. So God bless you and your family in the future. Good to you. Mr. Tony Cardenas. This is a wonderful day, but a sad day. Uh, it, it's sad to see this transition uh, because we're going to miss you so much. You're so special, uh, not only to the department and to people who you've mentored and people you've touched, uh, but uh, me uh, having you come to the gang committee over and over and over and over and when uh, Chief Beck was assistant chief and both of you would come and answer questions and bring back information and dialogue with us and then we would have meetings in the community uh, where you were there and it's very intense and very emotional because dealing with gang issues is all of that and much much more and uh, I remember sometimes I could see the look on some of the, the people's faces who were kind of like, what's this white dude in a uniform going to tell us that's going to actually make a difference? But when you spoke, you let everybody know, yes, I'm a police officer, but I understand what you're going through. I know what it is and what it takes for us to approach this issue in a way that's proper, balanced, respectful, forceful, and appropriate. And that was something that you just took people by surprise and you really proved that when you are a professional and you're a police officer, it's not about the gun, it's not really about the badge, it's about the heart that you bring to your job. I just cherish those memories when you and I worked together and that you actually spoke the truth and you actually let people know what we need to do as a community, as a society, not just as a police force, in order to make sure that we get it right. I just want to thank you so much for the professional that you are and the beautiful person that you are and I really, really am going to miss working with you in that capacity. I do have a suggestion and I'm going to steal it from my, my, my friend and colleague, uh, you know, Mitch Englander, when he said, you know what, Joe ought to hire him to be one of his consultants in his office. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, that would be an awesome, awesome uh, opportunity for the city of Los Angeles to keep you engaged in issues that are so important to us because we do have many, many issues to deal with in this city. And thank you so much for bringing it 110% every single day of your career. And I hope to see you. I don't know where or how. Maybe, Joe, <laughs> you figure out how to keep them around. But uh, thank you so much, Pat. Thank you for being a friend to your colleagues, to all of us. Thank you for being the professional, the ultimate professional, and God bless you on whatever you decide to do.
Mr. Tom LaBange. Thank you very much. Uh, Pat, congratulations to you and your family and just hearing our colleagues speak. Every day is a blessing. You know, you're here, which is great. I think of Jimmy Tatro. Uh, Jimmy didn't get here. Uh, uh, everybody who went before you. I think of all your span, how many officers you touched, even when you were a rookie, all the way through the chiefs, the administration. But the ability to serve the public is the greatest position one could really have, whether it's in any role, whether you're working for public works, or in public safety, or a public librarian who tells you what book to read that gets you to your, to your career. So you've had impact. I want you to enjoy your life and your family and your sons on the department, which is special. And you've done quite well as being a deputy chief. I didn't know what you thought when you first became on the job and said, I got to be a deputy chief. You want to get away from deputy chiefs when you first got on the job. Uh, but you did it, Patrick, and you made a difference and you impacted people's life that all of you now have made a transformation in making a positive image of Los Angeles. Because at 2 in the morning, the council doesn't come out, our deputies don't come out, it's your officers that come out. And they got to make quick decisions. But it's the leadership and the backbone that you give them that help them serve the people of Los Angeles. I personally want to congratulate, and I also want to say, go to the top of the tower today. That badge you wear is the greatest badge of any law enforcement agency in the world, and it represents Los Angeles. And when this building was built in 1928, we were a puppy city. We said we're going to have the tallest building. What did we choose? We chose the baths of the Grand City Hall, because the police department used to be in this building years ago, years and years ago. So it meant something. So enjoy and reflect and have fun. And I, I know uh, Tony suggested you be a consultant. I know he's got a deputy job on Beacon Street to walk in the afternoon, so he helped clean that up. Okay. Chief Parks. Thank you very much. Well, Pat, uh, I think our lives have crossed a couple of times. Uh, I think uh, when you went to Harbor, we had a lot of people call one about why this baby captain was coming down to run Harbor area, but you did a remarkable job there, and I'm so pleased to see you progress the way you have. Uh, great things about drop. The negative is people leave in the middle of their career uh, because of that mandate, and so we are losing a, a, a great person. Uh, there's only one group of people that are happy you're leaving, and those are the ones on the deputy chief list, and I understand that uh, because that's the way the process works. Uh, so somebody is sitting there already uh, shining up that other bar, and so that's, that's a, a decision that the chief's got to make. But congratulations, congratulations to the family. Uh, you've given a lot. There's no one that's had a successful career on LAPD without a firm family foundation because there's no way you can be successful in this large organization without the family holding together and making sure things are running well at home. And so congratulations to the family. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in the future and hopefully all those retirement wishes and things you have come true. And before you let uh, Pat speak. I tell you, the older I get, the, the smaller the world gets. I've just been informed that Becca, who works with me, grew up hanging around your place with your daughter, Christina, that they've known each other since kindergarten. And when they attended college, they uh, were roommates even though they went to different universities. So I tell you, the older we get, the smaller the world gets. Ms. Perry? Thank you very much, Mr. President. And so now I'd like to present to you Deputy Chief Pat Gannon and ask him to introduce us to his family members. And obviously he has his extended family here too, but uh, they are the, his rock and his foundation. And I know that he wants to share them with you today. And you know, it makes me sad to say, goodbye, but I think I'm just going to say, we'll see you later. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's give him a round of applause. He definitely deserves it. Thank you very much. Um, I, have been, I have been blessed. I, I would like to introduce my, uh, my family. Uh, my wife, Terry, she and I have been married for uh, 33 years. Wow. And, uh, Uh, my son Michael, uh, with the department, currently assigned to uh, to West Bureau. He's been with the department for uh, for seven years. My mother and my mother-in-law, uh, Chris Carr. 
uh, our youngest in our, in our family, uh, Christine Gannon. That's Rebecca's, uh, Becky's, uh, Becky, Chris, Christina. <laughs> Christina Gannon, second year law student at uh, Loyola okay. University. And Give her a round of applause. <laughs> my sister Denise uh, Gannon, and, uh, and we're missing one. My uh, youngest son is uh, an accountant for uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, and he's in training in Portland today, so he can't, uh, couldn't be here today. So I'm, I'm incredibly uh, proud of, 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 my fam of my family. Um, but thank you very much, um, Councilwoman Perry and, and Joe and, and everybody who had such nice things to say. I, I do appreciate that. I appreciate the council and the fact that uh, every time I've had to come before the council on a lot of different, uh, a lot of different issues, I was always treated uh, very fairly. And uh, um, it wasn't always necessarily the uh, most positive things because they, they were difficult issues, uh, but we did it in a way in which I thought we got things accomplished. And, and, uh, and to that, I'll always have that, uh, that, that memory, and that was, that was special. Uh, I thank Councilman Parks. Uh, he was the one who promoted me to the uh, to the command level of of, of captain. That really kind of launched me into the direction of uh, of deputy chief. And and to be perfectly honest, um, Tom Labonge mentioned that I have any idea that I would be a deputy chief. No, I didn't. Have, I had no clue at, at all. You know, my my grandfather uh, started as a Los Angeles police officer in 1927. Uh, um, and he actually, the building must have just opened because the story that he told me is he came here, um, was given the job as a police officer. They sent him across the street to a uniform store and said, buy your gun and buy your stuff and, and you're a cop. No, go, go off and do your, uh, do your stuff. And so he, uh, he was all over the, the city as a, as a police officer. My dad uh, joined the police department in uh, 1947. Uh, my grandfather retired in, in 1954. My dad went on to 19, uh, 1974. I didn't have the, the pleasure of actually working with my dad. Uh, I did work a, a, a station where he was at and, and heard a lot of stories that I didn't hear when I was a kid. Uh, that was always interesting. But uh, I've, I've, been, I've been blessed. And, and now to have uh, Michael on the job, uh, we, uh, it's, it's really, I, you can't put into words what you feel. Um, the pride for this organization, for this city, um, as, as I feel. So yesterday, Michael and I um, worked, a <laughs> we worked a, a radio car together. And uh, it, was, it was really special. It's really special. And we had a good time. We laughed. We gave a ticket out. <laughs> hey. The poor guy who's watching this would probably go, hey, that old guy was... Uh, <laughs> Tried to warn him, but he wouldn't take the warning. Um, but uh, and and we just had a great time down in in, in Harbor Division and uh, went by uh, Councilman Buscaino's um, home and and uh, ordered him out of his house with his hands up over the PA system, which was funny. He complied. <laughs> uh, but but I just had a wonderful career. Working for, uh, for Charlie Beck has been a dream come true. Uh, for him to have the faith in me to be a deputy chief and to be in South Bureau where I, I love South Bureau. I love that community. I know I don't look like that community, <laughs> but nobody treated me that I didn't. And uh, I've always had, a, had um, a lot of good relationships and, and strong partnerships in, 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 that, in that area. And I think together, We've reduced, we've reduced uh, crime very, very well. Bob Green, who's over here, has been my partner. He's going to be the new deputy chief for uh, Operation South Bureau, so I think Bob deserves it. And I couldn't have done anything that I've done, obviously, without my family and, and especially my, my wife, who did um, the boatload of work. And, and if my kids are successful, it's not, my, it's not because of me. It's because of everything that, that, Terry, that Terry did. Um, but uh, thank you to the council. Thank you for supporting not only me, but thank you for supporting the Los Angeles Police Department. I realize, and I, I watch all of you as you deal with very, very difficult issues. And I know the budgets are, are continue to be, be in a problem. And I know you all have worked very hard to make the Los Angeles Police Department a priority in, 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 that, in those budgets. And, and I know even in the coming years that's still going to be, be difficult. But I've seen the city of Los Angeles when we didn't have enough police officers. And it wasn't a good pl place to police. 
and the police department didn't have anywhere close to the level of respect that I think it has now. We still have a long way to go. There are still issues that uh, we have to overcome as, a, as an agency. Um, so in advance, I thank you for whatever support you can throw the way of the Los Angeles Police Department. And um, anyway, in 1978, I entered this department. I was very proud. I'm even more proud today of this agency. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before you, uh... I'll stain it. <laughs> no, you won't. You'll be fine. And we love you back. <laughs> Wanted to present this to you on behalf of the entire uh, city of Los Angeles, including the mayor. Um, just a memento for Thank you, you to uh, remember us. Thank you. I will. I will. Thank you very, very much. Another great hand for Deputy Chief Pat Gannon. Thank you very much. And the Gannon family. M Mr. Clerk, yeah, 21. Let's do 21. Mr. Kikorian said 21's okay to do an open session. Would you call that? Very good, sir. Uh, item 21. In the case entitled Maria Elena Cerrone versus City of Los Angeles, there's a recommendation to expend $250,000 in settlement. Very good. No speakers on the queue. Open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Ten eyes. Very good. Uh, let's call on the President of City Council, Mr. Herb Wesson, for a special presentation. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. President and members. Uh, I will be brief. Uh, Guillermo, yes. and if we could get the uh, youth squad to come before us tonight. Guillermo is the Deputy Mayor, Gang Reduction and Youth Development. And I wanted to take a moment to honor him and the young people that really make his summer activities successful. There's not a member on this council that hasn't heard of Summer Night Lights and the wonderful things that they do. This is the group of young people that basically work with other young people within the area of the park to help keep our cities safe. This program was started years ago. I want to say it was at eight parks. Yes. It's now at 24 parks. It's a nationally acclaimed uh, program in the areas where we have these projects. Uh, gang homicide is down almost 60 percent. These young people and their courageous leader have done a phenomenal job keeping us safe during the summer. And just to talk just a wee bit about summer night's lights. I don't know why, I always want to call it Saturday Night Live, <laughs> SNL, but, I, but it's Summer Night Lights. The parks are open for extended hours. They have extra programming and food, movies in the park, a variety of things to keep the children or young people busy doing positive activities. So with that said, I'd like to present to Guillermo, my friend who I've watched rise through the ranks, a certificate for the good works done by his Summer Night Lights project and all of the young people, the youth squad that stands behind me. Could we please give them, the leaders of tomorrow, a round of applause today. Now you can you're pointing picture. at me, Mr. President. I want a good picture. Your deputy's getting a good picture. And, but, Let's uh, uh, look this way. Oh. Eyes, eyes left. Okay, Guillermo. 
Let's hear it for the deputy mayor of all good. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you, Council President Wesson. Um, Summer Night Lights, um, with the help of the council, has actually expanded to 32 sites this wow. year. And, um, you know, over the years we have served since 2008 almost 2 million, we've had almost 2 million visits. We've served almost um, 1,400,000 meals, and we've provided over 3,500 jobs. But this program is not possible without the leadership of the young men and women standing behind me. They're often referred to as youth at risk. I believe that we are at risk for not getting to know them because they're extraordinary human beings. And when things get really tough, um, these young people really step up. So we're not here today. We're here to celebrate, but more than that, we're here to ask you to, in your spare time, get to know these youth because they are, in fact, the cream of the crop of the city. So if, if it's okay, I would like to bring up who they are and they can introduce themselves. Just come up and state your name. Okay. Hello, my name is Alicia Jenkins. I work at Jim Gilliam Park. Hello. Hi, I'm Taisha Hatchett, and I'm Youth Squad at Jim Gilliam Park. Hi, I'm Alicia Patterson. I work at Jim Gilliam Park. Hi, I'm Justin Schamberger. I work at Jim Gilliam Park as a Youth Squad. Don't be shy. Come on. <laughs> I'm Eric Medina, and I'm Youth Squad in Sun Valley Park. Gerardo Lomas, Youth Squad, Sun Valley Park. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Trujillo. I work at Sun Valley Park as a Youth Squad. Hi, my name is Evelyn Peñaloza. I work at Sun Valley Park. My name is Kimberly Mazriegos, and I work for Sun Valley Can you Park. you say a few words, Kimberly? Um, well, this is my second year returning from Sun Valley Park. Um, this program has provided a lot of good things for the community. And if it wasn't for the youth squad and being a team, it would have not worked so good. But uh, everything's been excellent so far. Mr. Wesson, what a great group of young people, and I know uh, uh, the deputy mayor in his office, the mayor's commitment, and also recreation and parks, John Muckery, the whole team, and I could see how you could uh, uh, make a mistake. I could, too. Look at those wonderful T-shirts, SNL. I, I, you, know, you got it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Yes, I'd like to, before you go away there, Mr. Zion wants to say a few nice words. Yes, they are nice words. I want to commend... The uh, I always call it Saturday Night Live also. Somehow it has that ring. But uh, the, the program extended to my district, uh, Lanark Park, the last two years. It's been very effective. Uh, I've opened the season there, cooking the food. Uh, great turnout from the community in cooperation with the community residents, Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, a lot of activities take place. I want to commend you, and I want to thank the mayor's office, and you, Guillermo, in particular, for bringing it out to the San Fernando Valley into the western region, because for many years they didn't think we had the need for such a program. We do have that in place. It's worked extremely well. The community has accepted it. The uh, police department appreciates it. I appreciate it. So I want to thank you and the folks that are working at, at the different parks. You are making an impact. You are making a difference in keeping people in the community safe. And it's a wonderful benefit to have that program. So I wish we could have every park participate. But obviously we don't have the funds for that. But you're doing a great job with it. I want to thank you personally. And I know you're leading the charge. It's uh, well received. So appreciate for all of you for being here and the good that you do with the program. Thank you. Mr. Cardenas, thank you, Mr. Zion, for those nice comments. Mr. Cardenas. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, thank you, uh, Council President Wesson, for uh, bringing this uh, to our attention once again so that we can actually tout the tremendous success of this uh, aspect of what we do in our parks now. And I call that an aspect of what we do in our parks because it's not yet part of the infrastructure and expectation that we're going to do this forever in our parks. But I hope that what we've demonstrated and what the mayor's office has demonstrated and through the leadership of Guillermo Cespedes and his team is that this is cost-effective, 
it's life saving, it's crime reduction, it's all of the above, but more importantly, it's, it's, it's an organic proof that when we, the adults, provide some leadership and opportunity for our children, they rise to show leadership. And they rise to show us that, hey, we're ready. If, 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 you're, if you provide me an opportunity to apply for a job and to get selected to take on that responsibility, I will shine. And these young people are shining. And remember, they're not in the most tranquil communities or most tranquil parks in the city. We're talking about the most challenged parks in our city. And we have teenagers who are showing that they can handle it. They can handle mediating their colleagues. They can handle taking on responsibilities in our toughest neighborhoods and that they can actually do the job, if not as well, perhaps better than some of us adults. Because sometimes what our young people need is to look into another young person's eyes and relate to each other and realize the right way to do things and know that that's not the right way to do it by doing it the wrong way. And that to me is at the core of what Summer Night Lights is about. It's about us as a community challenging ourselves to empower the community and also to challenge ourselves to get rid of the ridiculous mindset that our young people aren't ready for the challenge. They are. How many of you young people enjoyed your summer? How many of you young people thought it was the easiest thing in the world? Well, I'm, I'm, I appreciate your honesty because the bottom line is it is easy, easy but it's difficult, right? It's easy but it's difficult. But like we just honored a, 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 one of our officers who's been with the department over 30 years he brought exactly the same thing for 30 years that you brought all summer. And that is just bring it. Just bring it. Just bring yourself. Make the best of it. Be the best person you can be. And you can make a career out of it. You can make it part of who you are. It, I can tell you, if Gannon were in this room right now, they're all taking pictures with him and get him, giving him hugs for all of his wonderful service. If he were in this room right now, he would agree with me that you and him are the same. You're the same. You're the same. So congratulations for meeting the challenge and proving to us that you can do it. Now our challenge, Mr. President, right, our challenge is to continue to find the funding. Our challenge is to continue to expand it every single year so that it becomes what we do every summer at every park someday in, our dis in, in all of our districts and throughout the city. So thank you very much for all of your leadership. Thank you very much, Mr. Cardenas. Uh, Mr. Wesson. Yeah, just, just to close, I want to thank uh, Mr. Cardenas and Mr. Zion for those kind words and assure all of you that I will be working with Mr. Krikorian to make this a permanent program even when the current mayor moves on to his next challenge. It is an effective program. The numbers don't lie. Uh, it's something that we just need to have in place and that the young people can count on. So with that, thank you for allowing me to honor uh, these fine people. If you could give them another round of applause. Big hand. Thank you, Mr. President, the great Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Guillermo. Uh, members, we're going to take up item number two, which is an appointment. Uh, Mr. Clerk. Very good. Uh, item number two, it's the reappointment of Mr. Hector Gallegos to the board of the Los Angeles Convention Center. Uh, this item was held uh, for the distribution of the Trade, Commerce, and Tourism uh, Committee report. That uh, report has been submitted and is now uh, before council for its consideration. Thank you very much. We did have one card, but we had the hearing in committee, so we're not required now, and we'll thank you very much. Commissioner. Thank you very much for your serving. I know you were articulate in committee. Uh, share your views. The challenge is ahead uh, for our convention center. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, members of the council. Um, let me start by, uh, and for the record, my name is Hector Gallegos. Uh, I thank you for the invitation to appear before you here today. Uh, I'd like to repeat one of the things that I did say uh, in committee just two days ago, and that is how proud I am to be associated with the L.A. Convention Center. Uh, despite the economic downturn of the last several years, the uh, Convention Center has managed to operate in the black. 
that it makes it an exceptional convention center uh, relative to its uh, competitors across the nation. I look forward to supporting the mayor and the CAO in their vision for improving the economic impact that can be leveraged by the operations of the convention center and at, while at the same time being mindful of the goal of minimizing the stress imposed on the general fund. And with that, I'm glad to answer any questions. Good. And uh, what high school did you go to? Venice High School. Yeah, a proud graduate of Venice High School. Who are some of the great graduates of Venice High? Well, for starters, there is Walt Cunningham of uh, Apollo 7 fame, and he's brought to mind in light of the fact that the great Neil Armstrong passed away very, very, very recently. And he went to LMU, if I remember correctly. I don't remember, but that sounds about right. And he also okay. received an MBA somewhere along the line. I believe he is still alive, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Well, this is a great uh, appointing, members. There's no speakers on the queue. Mr. Gallegos, thank you very much for your service. And uh, Mr. Hill, thank you for your service. Well, let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Congratulations, so ordered. Uh, thank you for your commissionership. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'm going to call on at this time by order of the President of the City Council. Public comment. And please, when your name is called, come up. Al Sabo, Bill Huey, Carl Van Der Berg. Thank you. Good morning, Council. Uh, my name is Al Sabo, and I live in the 14th District, uh, Mr. Weezar's district. But for the second week in a row, comments that I have that pertain particularly uh, to the 14th District, specifically Pershing Square and the problems that exist there, uh, it was reported in the downtown news that uh, Mr. Weezar spearheaded a program uh, to eradicate the Pershing Square uh, of the Occupy LA movement. I can tell you that they did a good job in uh, eradicating the Occupy LA movement. They've now taken refuge in another part of the 14th district. However, uh, uh, the police that uh, are uh, remain throughout the park in many cases, 10 to 20 police officers each and every day it is not only a waste of our public resources, but uh, it, it does, it's also a burden on us taxpayers. There's no reason why they're there. They weren't there before the Occupy LA movement was there. They don't need to be there after the Occupy LA movement there. Pershing Square has always been a respite for everyone, the homeless and the wealthy alike. But yet today, uh, they've decimated the park. They've eliminated all shady areas of the park. They flood the park each and every uh, evening so that uh, the, the mud still remains during the day, so you can't even find a place to sit. Yesterday, as I was sitting behind one of their roped off areas, nine different police officers came up trying to remove me. I refused to move due to health reasons because it was the only shaded area left in the park. Thank you very much. Next speaker, Bill Hulley. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, members of the LA City Council. My name is Bill Huey. I have a friend with me. He bought a nightclub up in Council District 6. And the owner retired, so the owner closed the club. So it was closed for about five months. The club's been there for about 35 years. He's trying to reopen it, and ABC gave him a clean bill of health, the police commission, the finance office, everyone. But the planning commission said, we want proof that it was open since 1987 or before. He supplied that proof, and now they tell him they want proof that it was open since 1981. The problem is there's no government agency that goes back that far, so he cannot supply the proof. So here he has a nightclub where he wants to hire people, cooks, bartenders, bands. He wants to put people to work. He wants to create prosperity. He wants to pay taxes to the city of L.A. so they can finance youth programs and give money to the police department. And one clerk at the planning commission says, no, we won't, we won't approve this unless you can prove it was open since 1981. He's already proved it was open since 1987. He spent a lot of money doing research and this is the problem. We have one clerk, a desk clerk, is stopping the whole thing. These are maybe five or ten jobs that could go out. And I would appreciate it if Councilman Cardenas got involved in this, but 
this is really unfair. He's probably, if he can't open up, he's probably just going to sell the building. The next guy will probably demolish it. You've got too many people in the city making it hard for people to create prosperity for others. That's why we have this terrible image of being America's most business-unfriendly big city. I mean, read CEO Magazine, look at the Rand Corporation. Here he's put out all this money, and he's on the verge of losing his investment. And I just wish somebody would help him out so he can... Open up. He, you know, he's doing everything by the book. He's got all the paperwork, and they want him to go back now to proof from 1981. They keep changing the rules. This is insane and very, very unfair. And I'm Bill Huey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill Huey. Carl, yes, Mr. Cardenas. Um, what, what street is it on? I mean, or San Fernando Road. San Fernando, San Fernando Road. Road. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if you could look at this councilman, it'd be great if we could talk. My to planning you. deputy is coming down. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Vandenberg. Yes, my name is Carl Vandenberg. I work for Creative Investment Group. We own a property at 8351 San Fernando Road in Sun Valley. It's a 3,600 square foot building. It's on a lot that's 19,600 square feet. And the records show from 1987 through 2012 continuously being used as a nightclub, restaurant, bar with dancing and live music. However, when the new tenant wants to go into place and do the business that he wants to do, he's told that he needs to have a permit for dancing because there was no permit for dancing, and the only record is from 1964 that says that it was a nightclub, bar, restaurant. Um, I want to open this place. I, don't, I would like to pay the fees to open it. However, I've been told that if I paid the fees and supply the paperwork, that I have to wait at least 12 months for a determination from the city in order for it to be allowed whether or not it can have dancing on the location. It's always had dancing on the location. I don't mind paying the fee, but I cannot pay the fee and wait 12 months and lose all this money not being able to open for business simply because the quote-unquote whether or not dancing is allowed, even though it's been established that it's had dancing since 1987, but I am unable to supply them with proof prior to 1987. I am required to show proof from August of 1981. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I know uh, the office will be available to help you if uh, you could connect with that office. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Paul. Okay, uh, members, so I'm going to go to a special meeting right now. The request of uh, Ms. Perry for speakers who are here. Mr. Clerk. M Mr. President, we'll uh, recess the regular and go into the special. Alarcon Buscaino, Cardinal Englander, Garcetti, Wieser, Caress, Gregorian, La Mancha Parks, Perry, Reyes, Resident, Al Zion, Wesson, 10 members present. And a quorum, Mr. President. The first and only item before you is item 22, and it's, it's an item for which a public hearing has not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Let's uh, open the roll on consideration. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. Very good. We do have public comment card. Ms. Perry, you want to make an opening remark, and then I'll call public I, I'd comment. I'd just like to say what I have to say first, and then let's go right into public comment. Uh, today, colleagues, I ask for support of a resolution in support of Assembly Bill 1616. This is the Cottage Homemade Food Act that creates a pathway for the legal sale of safe, homemade, community-based food products. This is a well-thought-out piece of legislation that promotes the eat local spirit, a spirit that was born in California by an enabling the introduction of a whole range of small production, locally produced, high quality foods from California's communities, especially here in Los Angeles. To date, more than 30 states have cottage food, cottage food laws on the books. Many have been passed in the last few years. It is still illegal to sell any homemade food in California, and I think a change is long overdue. There is a trend in response to both the economic downturn of 2008 and the surge of interest in local food over the last few years. And there's also a growing awareness among consumers about food systems and issues and enthusiasm for buying locally grown and produce, locally grown food and produce, knowing the person who made your food. Loosening the regulations for small home-based businesses fosters growth 
in our local economy while giving startups the opportunity to test their products, establish a customer base, and incubate their business before investing in commercial kitchen space. Approval of this bill introduced by Assemblymember Gatto uh, will enable us to help these very small businesses prosper and foster the healthy local food movement, creating a new type of micro, micro entrepreneur in California. For a better part of the year, the Los Angeles Bread Bakers has been working with home-based food makers from both Northern and Southern California to craft and pass legislation that will permit the sale of not potentially hazardous homemade foods in California. And I, I'm, I'm happy to welcome Mark Stambler today, the main driver of this bill with Assembly Member Gatto. So when all is said and done, I hope that you'll support this. Thank you, Ms. Perry. We do have uh, cards from the public. In fact, Mark Stambler is the first. Mark, are you here? If you could come forward. Uh, Tara Cola and uh, John Walsh. Go right ahead, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Mark Stambler. I live in Los Feliz, and uh, I'm a bread baker. In fact, I'm one of the founders of the Los Angeles Bread Bakers. We have over, believe it or not, over 300 members, people in the greater Los Angeles area who uh, are devoted to baking bread generally at home. Uh, when we discovered that there was no way that we could legally sell the bread that we made at home, we thought there must be some mistake. But we quickly found out that it was no mistake. Here in California, we cannot sell the bread that we make at home. Uh, so for the better part of the past 14 months, we've been working with the Sustainable Economies Law Center in California and with Assemblyman Mike Gatto, who kindly introduced this legislation last fall. And uh, right now we're coming down to the home stretch. Um, if there had not been a technical error made on the bill yesterday by the Legislative Council up in Sacramento, it would be introduced in the State Senate today. But I have been assured that the glitch will be corrected and it will be introduced tomorrow and it should be passed both houses of the Assembly and the, the Senate by the end of the week and sent to Jerry Brown for his signature sometime in September. And we know that your support, uh, which we will uh, send immediately up to the Governor for his attention, will make a difference because it's not a slam dunk because we all know Jerry Brown has his own way of thinking about these things, but uh, we are strongly in favor of it. And thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Next. My name's Tara Kohler, and I've been operating a community-supported agriculture program in Silver Lake for three years. Um, our community-supported agriculture program, or CSA, um, is uh, designed to bring local food grown by local farmers in Los Angeles and neighboring counties and it connects local food with members of the Silver Lake community. And um, so by allowing AB 1616 to pass, then this uh, will bring more local food in, in touch with our members of our community. We have, for the uh, just before Mark Stambler was um, shut down, we had his bread for at least a year and nobody was ever sick. In fact, people loved it and want more and more of it. But, so I can't wait for AB 1616 to pass. Um, also, I think that it's a natural progression because the city very recently um, passed the Food and Flowers Freedom Act, and then following that, they allowed the um, they passed they made it uh, they permitted uh, farmers markets to operate in residential zones. And so, in those farmers markets in residential zones, you'll be able to see your neighbours with their homemade foods, offering those to their members of their community for some extra cash to help us out in tight times. So thanks for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Walsh, followed by Joseph Saldener and Daniel Kent. John Walsh, blogging at Hollywood Highlands, H-I-G-H-L-A-N-D-S dot org, or just go to Walsh Confidential. Welcome to the state of California, where it is legal presently to sell marijuana, but it is illegal to sell bread. Uh, we'll have a fr uh, and incidentally, Big, big uh, food, the food industrial complex feeds us Franken food. They, I don't think any of these homemade uh, sales people who create their uh, food and sell it to us, I don't think they're, 
genetically engineering food. And you will have a chance, all of us will have a chance to vote yes to put labels on genetically engineered food. 100% in favor of homemade food. How many other states in the union right now ban the sale of homemade food? I'm interested in that. HollywoodHighlands.org. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Mr. Cardenas, you wanted to... Yes, Mr. President, I just, uh, without getting into de details, because it's not an agendized item, I want to thank the gentleman for coming forward and expressing uh, the need to, to get clarity on a property that he owns. This is the one for all of you watching that the gentleman just talked about, the ability to have live dancing uh, there. And uh, I just want to say that uh, my office has been communicating with this gentleman. I have an, a copy of an email of which I won't read the details because it's between my office and the gentleman uh, that uh, he did thank my staff for working with him and rightfully so. He said, I may continue to need your help and we're here to help you and hopefully we can remedy this. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Joseph, followed by Daniel Kent. Yes, sir. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, honorable council members, and um, I want to thank Councilwoman Jan Perry for introducing uh, this, uh, this resolution. Uh, I'm Joseph Schuldiner. I'm the director of the Institute of Domestic Technology, uh, a food preservation and food crafting institute. Um, and I'm also the manager of the Altadena, uh, certified Altadena Farmers Market. Um, we support this uh, AB 1616 um, for our vendors and farmers. Every week at my market, I get at least three to four uh, potential business people coming up to me wanting to sell their homemade products at the, um, at the market. Um, and when I explain the sort of barriers uh, to that, uh, it, it's discouraging to them. So uh, I think that this bill would open up uh, incredible uh, economic opportunities uh, to the small businesses uh, that can um, uh, work at home. The, uh, the cost barriers to um, food vendors uh, in Los Angeles are hundreds of dollars a month in rental, uh, commercial kitchen rentals. And this bill would sort of t take that financial burden um, off of some of these micro entrepreneurs. So I think it's a, uh, an excellent way to incubate small business, uh, to incubate uh, uh, artisanal food businesses, uh, in the city. Um, what, uh, oh. Actually, I think that's, uh, that's it. So uh, I support this bill and, and thank you again. Yes, sir. Thank you, Councilwoman Perry, for introducing this resolution. Uh, when it comes to small business, it doesn't get any smaller than me and my business, which I started with a friend of mine about now, uh, nine months ago. Things are going really well and we're growing quickly, but that has been in spite of health department barriers, specifically the incredibly expensive commercial kitchen requirement. Our success is also due in large part to the public spirited efforts of Joseph Schuldiner and his farmers market to incubate small businesses like mine. AB 1616 will broaden accessibility of business ownership and ensure that my business and countless others in Los Angeles will be financially nimble as we grow. But the benefits are not only to the owners, of course. According to the SBA, 99% of businesses with payrolls in this country are small businesses. We employ more than half of all workers and create 80% of new jobs. So let's make it easier, faster, and less costly for entrepreneurs to put people back to work, boost tax revenue, and energize the food movement. Let's see what millions of inspired, talented, and industrious Angelinos can do. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Zine. Thank you, Mr. President. I only have one concern, and that is the, the health condition. We have the health department that inspects restaurants, and that came about because of contamination reports. Uh, so health department now does inspections at restaurants, and there's a posting, catering trucks, et cetera. My only question, if someone can answer that question, what is the aspect on, on the, the conditions in which the products are manufactured? And there's any standard that the health department prescribes to make sure that those products uh, don't cause any kind of issues with the consumers. Uh, that's the only question I have. I support the concept. I think it's a great idea. But the health issue is the concern that I have. Ms. Perry, if you have the answer to that. Actually, 
uh, uh, Mr. Stamler could uh, answer it very well, but if you refer to the uh, Chief Legislative Analyst Report dated August 28, 2012, it does enumerate on page two the requirements for uh, cottage food operators, and it, it enumerates the uh, conditions under which cottage food preparation can take place in terms of packaging and handling and, and, and how you interact with domestic activity and that children, infants, small, small children, pets cannot be in the preparation area and only normal types of kitchen equipment and utensils can be used to produce cottage food projects, uh, products and, and all food contact surfaces, equipment, utensils used for home food preparation must be washed, rinsed and sanitized before each use and smoking is pro prohibited in the food preparation area which is a big deal. And who would be responsible for the inspection to make sure that they meet the standard? Well the Department of Public, you want to answer that question? Come to the mic. If you, if you can, I'm, that's the only concern that people yeah. may have. Yeah, there are actually there are two classes of, uh, of operations that would be permitted. Class A is the direct sales to consumers through farmers markets, and Class B, which is indirect sales, which means you can sell through shops and restaurants. But the people one who the, engage, one the farmers market is controlled by the health department. They do. They both are. They oh. both are. Then it, the the LA County Department of Public Health is re ultimately responsible for inspecting, right. and there is a, cr uh, uh, a provision for inspecting the, these. the premises where it's manufactured. Yes, exactly. Okay. That was my only concern. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. No more speakers on the queue, uh, Madam Clerk. If we could uh, prepare to vote on this item, if we, oh, Miss Perry, is to adopt the Chief Legislative Analyst Report uh, dated August 28th, 2012. Okay, then let's uh, open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Okay, thank you. So do we need to recess or uh, end, uh, adjourn the special meeting? Yes, sir, we should adjourn, adjourn the special so meeting. Let, let's adjourn the then, special meeting. No. And it, should, it should go forthwith. It should go forthwith before we adjourn, but let's adjourn and return to the regular scheduled meeting. And I want to call up, uh, we'll go back into um, general public comment. If we could get Renee and Vilma Hernandez. I'm having difficulty with this one name, Michael. Lorraine Carey, all of that to say Lorraine Carey, all righty then. And uh, Arnold Sachs followed by Mr. Walsh. Yes, go right ahead. Good morning. I am here because we purchased a property in the Silver Lake area, 2009. The real estate agent gave us a list of names of six people. When we moved to the property, there were 13 people in the, in the property. It's a duplex, so we live in the back. We've uh, uh, tried to address this issue with the LA, uh, Los Angeles Housing Department. They say it's not under their purview. Yet now there's 15 people living in a house which is uh, 1,080 square f uh, foot or feet. And uh, uh, it is an overcrowding condition. It is an unsafe living condition. I have tried to bring this to the attention to the Villarraigosa's office as well. But nobody seems to enforce any overcrowding living condition, which this is subjecting children and senior citizens and people living in this un unhealthy, unsafe living condition. And as a landlord, I am concerned. I brought it to the LA Housing Authority Department and nothing has been done about it. I am concerned because more kids are, are you know, there's two that were born this year and how much wear and tear can we take? You know, we pay 4000 a month of mortgage. These people are also just paying 1460 Are we set to fail? You know, nobody is listening to us, and that's why we're here. And, uh, Go right ahead, sir. We serve them a six-day notice for the additional tenants, and they went to housing, and they complain about it. 
and housing asked them for, to prove that they've been there since 1992, like they claim, and they were not able to provide that proof. And LA Housing stayed quiet and didn't say anything to us. Okay, Mr. Labange, yeah. are you going to ask that they Well, I think they uh, live in uh, the Mr. Garcetti's district, but right near where mine was. If they can come to the ropes, we'd like to help you. Thank you for coming down in public comment. Yeah. Come over here. Yeah, and speak to... So wait, now I think I have it. Lacey Ann Carrier, right? Yes, sir. Okay, come on forward. Well, Mr. Cardenas, okay, just, before just, you start. Well, one second. Uh, Tom Labonge, to, to the family that came forward or what have you, uh, just understand that there's various levels of government. I didn't hear you say that you talked to the county. Based on the conditions that you described, make sure that you engage the county of Los Angeles as well, especially if there are children involved. Okay. We'll speak with Mr. Labonge. Yes. Speak Thank with you. Mr. Labonge. Hi, young lady. Hi. Honorable ladies and gentlemen of Los Angeles City Council, I am Lacey Ann Cole Carrier and I am eight years old and I am here today for National Lemon Juice Day. I will be outside from 12 to 2 serving fresh free lemonade and also accepting donations for Alex's Lemonade Stand and Justice for Tara Calico. You may or may not recognize me and my brother from television, but today we are here as future voters and concerned citizens. When life gives you lemons, you gotta make some fresh juice. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you outside. No, thank you. Let's give her thank you very much. And at such a young age, doing great things like that. Mr. Arnold Sachs followed by John Walsh. Morning, Mr. Sachs. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Um, after an hour and a half, two minutes for speaking about the new commissioner for the Convention Center, BFD. A well thought out piece of legislation, Jan Perry? That's an oxymoron. Anyway, that being said, um, I did want to talk about something regarding the LA blight and, and the Congratulate the city council for their action they took on the parks, the new parks that the mayor has proposed and the parkettes, and actually give you a solution. Um, this article from the 24th in the LA Times, more of a park place. Two new parks where four closed homes once stood in South LA are part of the larger screen, a uh, lot of the larger green space campaign. And then this headline, L.A. blight law goes unenforced. Well, if these two homes were foreclosed upon and they were blighted homes, why weren't they cited for violations of the L.A. blight law that's two years old? Somebody from the city would have gone out to look at the homes and say, hey, you know what? These homes are suffering from blighted conditions. And we have an ordinance that the city council passed that allows for a thousand dollar fine per day for blighted homes. Why wasn't it enforced? This is a perfect opportunity to fund the parks program that Councilman Cardenas talked about by going after these blighted homes. Here's an article from the Daily Breeze from the 20th of June that states in San Pedro and Wilmington there's over 3,400 homes that are foreclosed upon. If 10% of those were blighted, that's 340 homes times $1,000 a day that the city would be collecting if somebody got out and inspected. Oh, they're going to go out, the county's going to go out and inspect home kitchens for baked bread. Maybe they can inspect the homes while they're looking for porn shoots. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sachs, very much. Uh, HollywoodHighland.org, John Walsh. John Walsh blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org. Democracy in action. You see that girl was eight years old. There is no restriction. You can come up here and if you're four years old and speak as long as you're on topic. That's what I like about California. Uh, first of all, I'm asking you to pass a resolution next week to keep Pat Morrison at KPCC. As you know, an evil vice president named Russ Stanton who used to be the uh, uh, LA Times editor stabbed her in her back 
while she was in Washington, D.C. He's sexist. He's ageist. I'm asking everybody, make five, ten, twenty calls to KPCC and say, bring back Pat Morrison, you ugly, sexist pig. And John Walsh will agree with you. Call them now. Let them know. Now, as far as we have color commentary now, as you know, on the, uh, on the Republican convention, and that is Antonio Villaraigosa, 2016 presidential candidate, and he's already has his ticket, Lou Parker for vice president. I don't see why he is there running for president. Why, uh, why isn't he here uh, doing his job? And we'd like to say that the crime in Hollywood is out of control. I don't know if you heard about the six-year-old girl that was killed in a traffic accident because the traffic is out of control in Hollywood this morning at 7.30. And three other people were critically injured. And where is Mr. Uh, Mr. Garcetti? He is making phone calls while he is in active duty, making phone calls, trying to get money. Now, I've got good news from Ms. Perry because, in fact, she's gaining on Garcetti and right Right now, the slight favorite for the next mayor is Wendy Gruel. HollywoodHighlands.org to find out what's really happening in this city. Thank you, uh, Mr. Walsh. Uh, Mr. Clerk, uh, it has been requested items 8, 9, and 18 go forthwith. And with that said, We're going to take up item 13, and I'm going to ask Arnold Sachs to come back up and speak on this item. Mr. Sachs, the floor is yours. Mr. President, please be advised that for item 13, there is amending motion 13A, Buscaino and Englander, that has been submitted and distributed for Council's consideration. Yes, thank you. Good morning again, Arnold Sachs. This is a sale of surplus city-owned private uh, properties, not pro of city-owned properties, through auction, and it states here that the uh, city will receive $9.4 million based on the minimum bid set for each parcel prior to the payment of the cost of sales. The net proceeds, proceeds will be deposited in the appropriate accounts as provided by law, but it doesn't mention what the appropriate accounts are. And I'm just curious because, for example, when the city bought Ontario Airport and there's been discussions regarding the sale of Ontario Airport it states that the proceeds would be returned to Lawa but Lawa didn't buy the city the, the Ontario Airport and when Lawa, the city bought the parking lot out at LAX Mr. it States that the sale talking about of this the, item He'll get back. He said the sale of the asset belongs to Lawa. So here the city is selling assets, but it doesn't state who's actually getting the proceeds from these assets. Maybe the proceeds from these assets could be used by the neighborhood councils. You have an item on your agenda regarding that, where they're going to get funding for their elections. That's an idea. Thanks for paying attention, as always, and thank you for your time. Um, yeah, another waste of day. All right. Uh, no speakers in the queue. So, we're, Mr. City Attorney, you need to make an announcement? Yes, just, just for clarification, this item 13A will be treated, should be treated as an instruction to the City, city Attorney's Office to come back with an amended or, ordinance uh, with the help of the General Services Department and an instruction to the city clerk to place uh, this amended item on the September 11th agenda. Okay, with that said, Madam Clerk, let's prepare to vote. Let us open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. We'll now move uh, to item 14 that was held special by Mr. Walsh. John Walsh, HollywoodHighland.org. Thank you. This is a uh, salary recommendation. In other words, it's a raise. Somebody's getting a raise. I'm not a union member. 
This is for Gary Lee Moore. He's a general manager. These people are all picked by the mayor. Before, in our old city, city charter, when Bradley was in, the mayor didn't get to pick these people. General managers are now picked by the mayor. Okay? That's, that's, okay, now it says, council may recess the closed session for the above salary recommendation. Okay, so look at it now. There's no recommendation. We don't know how much money you're giving him. We know that you have the right to go into closed session. But at least in, in America, if I lived in El Salvador, they'd take me right now, drag me out, and put a bullet through my head. Thank God I live in America. HollywoodHighlands.org. Okay. Uh, oh, Mr. Zein. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. On this matter, uh, Gary Lee Moore is the general manager of engineering, and I'm wondering what the difference is in compensation from his current position to ITA. I don't know if you need an executive session for that, Mr. City Attorney, or if that can be disclosed public. Council is voting on the salary, so that, that can be done in open session. Well, then the question is, the numbers aren't here. He is a general manager now. He's been a general manager for a number of years. I don't know what the difference is between, is he going to be doing two jobs? I, I think staff should be uh, answering that is question. Is staff here to respond to that? The, the question on Mr. Moore, uh, engineering, he is, and he has been a general manager of engineering for a number of years. Yes. Is he going to be doing two jobs, and is this salary on top of his current salary, or how is this all working out? Um, no, Marita Aspen from the CAO's office. Um, he is going to be the interim general manager of ITA and be paid as such. But what about his job as engineer, city uh, engineer? He may go back to that position at, after his interim um, term is over. Um, so he's not, he's, not, he's not going to be paid for both jobs, no. All right, so what's his current salary as, as engineer, and then what's his proposed salary? His current salary as a city engineer um, is 235000 um, and we are recommending that he um, receive 248000 which is the uh, previous incumbent salary. And the person who's leaving, um, what's the salary of the current general manager of ITA? The 248000 so we pay ITA considerably more than the city engineer? In this particular instance, yes. There, there's a, a very broad range for, most of, for all of the general manager salaries, um, and the range for this particular, um, for ITA, is anywhere between um, – I'm sorry, I don't have that chart with me. Okay, I, I just have but a – it's a very broad range. I mean, if you're making 235 or 248, it, it's obviously a substantial salary. And, and if we look at what's happening with our economic situation, et cetera, how do we justify an increase in that type of salary? You would have to ask the mayor, sir. Uh, the mayor's, uh, I think, in Florida. That could be. All right. But this was recommended to the ERC, and it was approved. Okay, thank you. Mr. Labange. Well thought out of, and Gary Lee Moore and his skills and talents is one of the fine uh, general managers, and the mayor picked him uh, to move to ITA at this time. He'll still have his hand and heart in engineering, I believe, but at the same time, this is the appropriate compensation, and I appreciate the CAO's office. Thank you. Okay, there are no additional speakers in the queue. Uh, Madam Clerk, open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. Nine eyes, one no. Okay. M Mr. President, if I may, the EERC yes. voted to approve the mayor's salary recommendation of $248,346.72 per year for Mr. Gary Lee Moore as interim general manager of the Information Technology Agency. Okay. Um, Mr. Zine, I believe you held an item. That item has been... Uh, Forthwith on the previous item. On yes. number 17, a substitute motion was uh, submitted this is on behalf of Mr. Rosendahl. So a substitute motion was submitted on 17. So we 17. Do we have that motion? I Do understand we? it was circulated. 
Okay. In there. Mr. President, yes. Uh, motion 17A has been uh, submitted and distributed for council's consideration. And that okay. was on behalf of Mr. Rosenbaum. Okay. So on that item, let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. Okay. That uh, passes as amended. Mr. Forthwith. Mr. Koretz. Item 18, I think, you held. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as we all know, in uh, 2004, the federal government allowed the 1994 assault weapons ban to expire. And we've all seen the ill effects of this uh, from the uh, Aurora, Colorado shooting to the Sikh shooting, Gabriel Gifford shooting, as only the most high profile examples. The need for a federal assault weapons ban to be reinstated is more pressing than ever. And AJR 45 um, at the state level calls on Congress to reenact this ban. It's a common sense measure that I believe everyone can support, and I ask for your eye vote. Thank you, Mr. Koretz. We do have a card from John Walsh. Mr. Walsh, please come forward. John Walsh, HollywoodHighland.org. Uh, thank you. This, obviously we're in favor of this, but we're in favor of a broad investigation of these weapons. As you know, the police commission has reopened an investigation on LAPD officers selling their guns for profits. You saw that in the, in the paper. Thank God for the new IG there. And also, we believe that the, the police attitude and their weapons at the Oak Tree Gun Club, which you are paying them, what, $60,000 to the Oak Tree Gun Club so that LAPD officers can shoot assault rifles there? Isn't there? You know, you passed that already. There's a gigantic gun conspiracy with the LAPD assault weapons. I don't know. Oak Tree Management. In fact, John, this is 100%. Okay, if With you tell item. me I'm off the subject, I'll accept it, but not when Dion says it. HollywoodHighlands.org. Uh, Mr. Walsh, if just adhere to the rule that uh, you notified everyone about last week, and then you and I are good, okay? Uh, now, if we could bring, I think it's item 15. Oh, okay, let, let's vote on this item. Let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Ja uh, Mr. Walsh, does he have more time? We're going to go to item 15, and the rep from the CAO's office may want to stay present. Yes, uh, forthwith, Mr. Forthwith, Koretz? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Walsh. John Walsh, the two minutes on the special meeting doesn't count for the five minutes. Okay, here's another one. This one, salary recommendation for Ms. June Lagme, and thank we heard just before. Who makes these salary recommendations? And she said it right there, the mayor, under the city charter that, that Reardon passed. The mayor controls the money. Now, how much is the city clerk going to be getting? How much was she getting? How much was the engineer, who's now no longer the chief engineer, now no longer doing this job? Who's doing the chief engineer's job? I see she is in control of writing this agenda. Ms. Lagme. And you'll notice in, the, in the, uh, uh, the agenda, there's no mention of her, what the increase. And again, you have the right to go into recess to, to, uh, to discuss Ms. Lagme's money. I'm telling you, 100,000 here, 100,000 there, it adds up. HollywoodHighlands.org. Mr. Zine? Sorry. You're okay? Yeah. yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, on this item, let us uh, open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. We have to re-vote? Nine ayes, one no. Okay. M Mr. President, uh, if I may, the EERC voted to approve the CAO's salary recommendation of $192,137.76 per, per year for Ms. June Lagme as city clerk. Okay, thank you. The next item... We'll take item 16, called uh, special by Mr. Walsh. Item 16, Mr. Walsh. Uh, 
One million server requests a year. I'll show you our uh, analytics anytime you want to see them. HollywoodHighlands.org. Again, now I want to have, uh, I'm 100% in favor of all fire pensions, all police pensions. I think they've all earned that money. I am really tired of people going after pensioners who spent 20 or 30 years who maybe are getting, you think, or somebody thinks 15 or $20,000 more a year than they deserve when Barclays Bank in England stole $1 trillion from us. And no one gives a damn. All they want to do is go after the pension people, the LAPD, the LAFD. And the answer to everything is cut the pensions. That's what, so therefore, we are 100%. And of course, for full disclosure, uh, I am eligible for a government pension at spending 25 years working for LAUSD. HollywoodHighlands.org. Thank you. So on this item, let us open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, item 19, Mr. Koretz, I'm going to move or send to your committee. So item 19... Uh, officially will be sent to uh, Mr. Koretz's uh, committee. So that leaves us with item one. I have cards from the public on item one. Okay. I have the vice president of MedPoint Management. I think it's Sheldon and John Walsh and R. Zandelli. Maybe. R. Zandelli. Yes, sir. Good State morning. your name for the record. Uh, Sheldon Lewinfoss, Vice President, MedPoint Management. I'm uh, oh, sorry. Sheldon Lewinfoss, uh, MedPoint Management, Vice President. I'm here today um, to see if I could get uh, item number 12-1296 uh, postponed for 30 days. Um, I've been in contact with the Office of Finance about working out a offer and compromise. Uh, just to give you a little background, uh, we were audited uh, in 2011 for years uh, 2008, 9, and 10. And um, the city of LA had put us into a new classification, which went from uh, $2.55 to $5.07. Uh, we then uh, fought this, uh, however, we did lose. And I've written, uh, I was told by uh, the auditor that I pay the uh, tax and interest, which I've done, and then I'd request a waiver for the penalties. Um, I followed those instructions. For the past year, I've written to pretty much every department in the Office of Finance, and uh, I received no human uh, calls or, or dealings until I spoke to. Um, a uh, Miss uh, Alicia Vega, finally, uh, she called me, we talked about it, and we're in the midst of a resolution to this matter. Uh, I had met with the city of L.A. Uh, and also the mayor himself, and he talked about revamping the system. And what happens right now in the city of L.A., you basically have 11 categories that all businesses are classified into versus the IRS that has uh, several hundred classification. So if you don't fit into one of these categories, you um, basically um, fall into the highest rate, which is professional and occupation. So I am requesting that we uh, postpone at least my case for 30 days until I have something worked out. Thank, Thank you. you. If I can get Office of Finance to come forward, sit at the center table, and if maybe I can get uh, Mr. Koretz and Mr. Englander to come up here with me for a second. And, and before the Office of Finance speaks, we'll let the other speakers come forward. So, uh, I, John, did I call you next? Yeah, okay, so John, uh, followed by Zandelli. John Walsh blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org. We put up a new post a week ago. We'll be putting up another one pretty soon. This is a list of miscellaneous deadbeats, okay? That's what, people who haven't paid their taxes, corporations that haven't paid their taxes. Uh, I just, I'm not going to take the two minutes. You know, uh, I don't need two minutes to make my point. My favorite here is $14,371.62. You must be really cold 
the Sacred Heart Hospice. What are these? Catholic nuns uh, making sure that people who are dying have, die with dignity, and you're after them for $14,000? HollywoodHighlands.org. Please go ahead, sir. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, R. Zandrelli, Mr. Zandrelli. I'm here to ask you to please postpone item number 12-1294. We're in negotiations with the finance department in reference to a uh, lien that uh, they want to place on, a corp on my corporation. Uh, if you have a little background on this, simply is that the department is trying to collect taxes for something we have not collected ever. There was a computer glitch on the taxes that we as a telephone company collect. Unfortunately, that glitch never collected taxes for, I think, one or two years. Now the department wants that money that we never have. Now they're not only asking for the money, but also they're asking for uh, penalties and fees on that as well, and interest on that. So if I've tried to talk to them at least to, I told them I was gonna pay for at least the principal, but I can't afford to pay for the penalties and the fees for something I've never collected. So if you could please direct them to at least have some okay, courtesy to that. Thank you. thank you. Before I have them respond, Mr. Zine, you wanted to ask a question? Well, this, this particular business is in my district. It, it shows that the, the liability, uh, there shows no interest. Um, and this dates back to 2008. Uh, my question is, was there correspondence to try and clarify any questions regarding this particular situation? Yeah, Bradley Moe with the uh, Office of Finance. And yes, the taxpayer has exhausted their administrative hearing rights. So there was a discussion, there was appeals, et cetera, so it's yes. gone through the system. Yes, it has. Because the gentleman said that there was a question about whether they collected the money or not. That's already been resolved? That has been resolved through the hearing And that process. was heard and resolved. And yes. there, it shows there's no interest due, so just collecting without interest? That's At least the sheet that I have dated August 14, 2012. Okay, that would be the uh, taxpayer midpoint. The what? ZTG would be the... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm uncertain on which... No, the, the letter I have, it, it's to us from Senior Management Analyst Bradley Moe, Office of Finance, Tax period 2008-2010, principal tax liability zero, interest zero, penalty. So it looks like they're just collecting the penalty and not the tax? Is this for MedPoint? I understand. Yeah, MedPoint. Yes, yes I don't uh, see. Med, well, this is 6400 Canoga. Is that, a, is that a separate one? The All right, the first big, the, the, the year with the 6400 uh, Canoga? Was paid. Uh, this is just the penalty portion. Um, oh, okay, I understand. I'm, I'm getting these confused. So there's a second case coming up now. So in your particular situation, the first gentleman on the 42,000. What are we doing with that one? Well, he requested 30 days. What did staff suggest? On medical management and consulting services. I'm sorry, I'm getting, I looked in the medical field. Um, on the gentleman that's standing behind you, what are we doing with that case? Not, not, not you, sir, the gentleman with the suit. Yes, medical, uh, MedPoint management. So what are you guys gonna do? He requested 30 days. Are you giving that a thumbs up or a thumb down? Well, actually, the Office of Finance will continue to work with the taxpayer to resolve the case. Um, but the Office of Finance would respectful, uh, respectfully request the council to approve the lien in case we are unable to resolve the matter with the taxpayer. Yeah, I, I would think that's a, the appropriate uh, manner in this. If you can't resolve it, then we're going to put the lien on the property and we're going to collect the money one way or another. If we can resolve it before that, that's fine. But we need to proceed. Again, this goes back to 2008, four years ago. Okay, and, and then the second case, what district is that? The other Z gentleman? ZTG. Okay. All right. Okay. What are you recommending that we do with ZTG? Again, the Office of Finance will continue to work with the taxpayer uh, to resolve the case. But in the meantime, we would... Uh, but this gives you leverage in the event. Okay. Exactly. We, All right. 
that, that should answer the questions. So that's what we're going to do. Mr. Labange, they're going to continue to work with both of the individuals in this case in hopes of working something out, but they are requesting that we move forward with this action today. Okay, but once they solve it, then they could catch up. You got an opportunity there. Thank you. Okay, so there are uh, no more speakers on the queue, so let us open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. Okay, Mr. Koretz, it's my understanding that you wanted to uh, reconsider an item that I believe was continued? Yes, I'd like to reconsider item 11. Okay, I want item 11. This vote is for reconsideration. Uh, if we could open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. Okay, this issue is now before this body. Is Mr. Arnold Sachs? No, we already had public hearing on this. Correct, Mr. City Clerk? Yes, okay. sir, that is correct. Mr. Koretz? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, there's something rotten on the November 2012 ballot here in California, and it's Prop 32, which is misleadingly called the Stop Special Interest Money Now Initiative. Now, I've always supported campaign reform efforts that are cutting edge, but this isn't cutting edge reform. It's cutthroat political trickery meant to destroy any chance of a fair electoral contest for progressive causes or anyone challenging the biggest moneyed interests. This measure was designed and placed on the ballot through the concerted efforts and massive contributions of the ultra-conservative Lincoln Club of Orange County and some of the very wealthiest corporate interests, executives, and retired CEOs. Money now more than ever already has a frighteningly immense impact on politics and any chance of a fair electoral outcome due to the dreadful Citizens United Thanks. decision of the United States Supreme Court. But Prop 32 isn't a corrective measure to that. It's actually no more than an all-out attack on the ability of working families to have any remaining political voice. Prop 32 seems to be more about putting the fix in than fixing our broken system. And the nonpartisan League of Women Voters in California has closely reviewed and strongly criticized Prop 32. Look, look over here. Yes. Okay. There are no other speakers on the queue. Uh, let us open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Nine eyes, one no. Okay, thank you, Mr. Koretz. That passes. Mr. Clerk, uh, what uh, business is uh, before this council at this time? Mr. President, uh, council has motions for posting and referral. Consider them posted and referred. The Next. desk is clear. Okay, the desk is clear. Announcements. Uh, Mr. Buscaino. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to remind my colleagues that photographer Adam Bushka will be in the fourth floor media room today, 2 to 4 p.m., taking photos of the no. H8 No Hate campaign. Uh, the campaign is a photographic silent protest founded three years ago by Bushka and his partner Jeff Parsley in direct response to the passage of Proposition 8. Photos feature subjects with duct tape over their mouths symbolizing their voices being silenced by Prop 8 and similar legislation around the world with no hate painted on one cheek in protest. The campaign began with, po began with portraits of everyday Californians from all walks of life and soon grew to over 20,000 faces, including politicians, military personnel, newlyweds, law enforcement, uh, artists, celebrities, and many more. If you've not RSVP'd and would like to have your photo taken and lend your face to this campaign, you can come by any time between 2 and 4 today. The entire process takes about 15 minutes. That's going to be in our media room uh, today. And thanks to... Uh, number of my colleagues who already agreed to do this. We'll see you between uh, 2 and 4 today in the media room. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Koretz. If I could just ask that uh, item number 11 also go forthwith. Forthwith on uh, item 11 without objection. Any more announcements? Okay. Could I get everybody in the council chambers to please rise for adjourning motions? If everyone in the council would please rise. Adjourning motions, Ms. Perry. Yes, I would like to adjourn in memory of Kareem Karagani. He was born January the 1st, 1927.
Mr. Karaghani served as a general in the Iranian Armed Forces under the late Shah for 35 years. After his retirement, he came to America with his wife to be closer to his family. His son, Sharam Karaghani, became the principal environmental engineer and division manager for the Bureau of Sanitation Watershed Protection Division. Mr. Karaghani was a devoted husband, son, and father who only wanted what was best for his family. He is survived by his son, Sharam, daughters, Shanaz, Mernaz, Farinaz, and seven grandchildren, Mercede, Madonna, Melanie, Melody, Ali, Arash, Lindsay, and Alexander. He will be sincerely missed. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Mr. LaBange, did I see your hand up? Ms. Perry, thank you. Uh, Glenn Lee Wong, 52 years old, struck down by cancer. The cousin of our very own Christine Hollis at the Legislative Analyst Office. He grew up in Sacramento, came down to go to UCLA, uh, graduated from UCLA, was on the marching band, played at the opening of the Olympic Games many times in the Rose Bowl, at the Rose Bowl game, and also uh, when UCLA had games there as well. Uh, he was a lifelong participant and advocate for many sports, including golf, tennis, and bowling, uh, and he was loved by many people. He lived a full and happy life, but cut short by cancer. His optimism uh, really was something very sp special. Uh, very loved by many people, and his quick humor will be missed by those who knew him. He's uh, survived by his fi fiance, uh, Billy Parsons, his parents, Frank and Lucy Wong, and his siblings, Vicki, Judy, and Stephen. Glenn will be missed, and we ask we adjourn in memory of Glenn Lee Wong. Thank you. Members, other adjourning motions. Mr. Alicone. Yes, Council Members, I'd like to adjourn in the memory of John Gustafson, uh, who served as the treasurer of the Little Lander Society in Tahunga until the end of 2011, and as a Bolton Hall docent until July of 2012. Bolton Hall is a beautiful, his historically restored building. Uh, he was born in 1931 in South Arkansas and raised uh, during the Great Depression. His father left before he was born, and his grandfather became like a father to him. He also remembers his mother taking him uh, for six-hour walks and for swimming in the woods every Sunday and who uh, was a crack shot with a pistol. For John Gustafson, 1949 was a big year. He wrote, I quit high school after the 11th grade, Mary, Mary, married Mary Jo, and took a job on the night shift at an oil refinery. I was playing saxophone in the band at a roadhouse house named the Howdy Club. There was a chicken, there was chicken wire between the band and the customers all the way to the ceiling. After enlisting in the Air Force in 1950 to avoid the draft, <laughs> he did boot camp in uh, San Antonio and then got lucky. They put me in the Air ROTC at Louisiana Tech. His wife joined him there as a music major. Uh, he majored in physics. John played in the dance band and learned to rebuild Pratt and Whitney engines. They lived in Vetville for $20 a month. By 1955, he was supposed to go full-time into the Air Force, but the Korean War was over and they didn't want him. He applied, uh, this, this obviously was casually written by <laughs> a close friend. Uh, he applied for uh, and won the National Science Foundation scholarship to Caltech after he graduated from Louisiana Tech in 1955, magna cum laude. The young couple headed for California in their 1949 Rocket Olds uh, with, uh, uh, with $125. They started their life in the West, sleeping in their car, which they parked on Sepulveda Mountain, where the 405 is today. Uh, John found a job in aerospace uh, with uh, Libroscope in Glendale, where he worked part-time while attending Caltech. After moving to, uh, to downtown Hollywood, Mary Jo got a job selling records at Wallach's Music City and later worked as a cocktail waitress at the the old Moulin Rouge on Sunset. They bought a house in Pacoima, and while at Caltech, John developed a nervous tick and couldn't handle the work, so uh, moved to UCLA. While in uh, the Hollywood Musicians Union, John met some friends at UCLA who got him started in playing with some named bands, uh, notably Les Brown and Ray Anthony. Uh, he and first wife Mary Jo eventually split up, and after a time he met and married Dolores Delancey, and they bought a house in La Crescenta. John stopped working in bands and got a job as a mission controller at JPL, where he stayed for 10 years. The couple was married seven years. They had a daughter and son, but after 1971 earthquake, Dolores took the children and moved to Stockton. John, with his son Eric, took care of John's mother from 85 to 91, and in 1985, after 20 22 years, John resumed playing in bands. He became a 32nd degree Mason, then played in the Shrine Band. 
He says, we started a dance band in Glendale and played every Wednesday evening in the summers for almost 20 years. John learned about Bolton Hall through friends. He met at JPL and joined the Little Anders Historical Society not long after that. According to John, I worked in aerospace for 55 years, ending up at Raytheon in El Segundo. They kicked me out after being 80, uh, 80 years old in August of 2011. He survived by two children, five grandchildren, and one great-granddaughter. Mr. Koretz. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to adjourn today in memory of a dear friend of one of my staffers who was taken away from us much too soon. Andy Wheeler passed away at Flagstaff Medical Center on August 23rd at the young age of 45. His funeral is being held right now in Flagstaff, Arizona. He was a self-employed contractor and a skilled carpenter who loved the outdoors, music, and river running through the Grand Canyon. He was one of the nicest guys you could imagine, who always lent a hand or an ear when it was needed. He had a kind heart and a generous spirit. He was preceded in death by his father, Carl Wheeler, survived by his mother, Janet Wheeler, his sisters, Lori Clayton, and Stacy Wheeler, and Stacy lived in Los Angeles for a number of years, as well as his nieces, Shara Wheeler, Lindsay Clayton, and Abby Clayton, and all, all of whom are of Flagstaff. He's also survived by his faith, faithful dog, Missy, and many friends, and I know his old friends, Nathan Martin, Sharman Pierce, and Andy Schrader, will miss him very much. Thank you, Mr. Koretz. Uh, members, any other adjourning motions? Then we are adjourned. Thank you, members. <laughs>